Bollinger in Children's Hospital, Freetown, Sierra Leone, Tuesday the 12th of November 2015. One-year-old Kadiatu had developed a high fever the previous evening, but her mother knew that the hospital was shut overnight, so she waited until the following morning to bring her to see the doctor. When they arrived at 10.41, they moved quickly into the triage department, uh, and the triage nurse saw them very rapidly at 10.50. She carried out the Ebola virus screening procedure, but she didn't check for any signs of serious illness. A medical student observer who was in the department noticed that Caddy seemed very pale, and also on closer observation was in respiratory distress. So she asked for a doctor to come and review and see if they could help. A doctor came at 11.15 and asked Caddy and her mom to go to the lab to get some blood tests. So they went down all the way into the hospital to the main lab, they came back to the outpatients department, and they sat and they waited. Caddy Atu died at 1.30 without having had any medical assessment and without having received any treatment. The nurses sorrowfully tied her hands and feet with plastic cord. They wrapped her in traditional cloth, and they called the mortuary team to come and collect her. So, good morning. <laughs> Thanks very much for asking me to be here. Thanks for asking me to talk. My name is Chris Hanson. I'm a British pediatrician. I've been working uh, with a group of my colleagues on a project which is coordinated by the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in the main children's hospital. Uh, in Freetown, Ola Duran Children's Hospital, which is also the tertiary pediatric referral center for all of Sierra Leone. Um, and that may surprise you slightly as we talk more about what's been happening recently. Uh, so, as most of you will know, Sierra Leone is a small country in West Africa, uh, which has some of the poorest social and health indicators in the world. It's 181st out of 188 on the Human Development Index. Uh, 120 out of every 1,000 children will die before their fifth birthday. And there are around 200 medical doctors for the entire population. In 2014 and 2015, along with its neighbors, Guinea and Liberia, Sierra Leone experienced an outbreak of Ebola virus disease, which quickly became an epidemic. And one of the poisonous legacies of that outbreak of Ebola virus disease um, was further to degrade health systems which are already very, very precarious indeed. So our mission, given to us by the Royal College, was to improve the acute care of children uh, who were arriving in the main children's hospital in Freetown. There were two of us who were pediatric registrars and one who was an emergency medicine registrar. And uh, this seemed to us like uh, uh, a reasonably scary proposition already, um, turning up as we were outsiders and not knowing anything about the place to which we were coming. Um, but the, the devastation, really, that had been visited on the health system uh, made that even more worrying. Uh, so we knew that our work had to start at the front door, and we found ourselves in a new triage area that had been moved from the main hospital to a temporary structure next to the holding center for Ebola patients. There were no processes in place for the children that arrived. Uh, so the medical patients mingled freely with those who were turning up for immunization, for food supply, for dressing change, uh, and there was no screening or at the triage measures other than infrared temperature um, and screening questionnaire for Ebola. Once they'd gone through the screening process, um, they sat in the queue to wait for the doctor, um, and the doctor was an intern who might or might not have been there. Um, there were six um, very badly stretched interns um, who were sitting in the hospital, um, and the hospital was closed at night um, because they couldn't make the road to work um, to allow somebody to cover overnight as well. Uh, so the, the children would sit in the queue, they'd get an assessment, uh, and then there was no equipment and there was no medication available in that area for the children to receive treatment. So they had to wait until they arrived in the inpatient ward. But sick patients with life-threatening problems stood no chance. So we initially thought that we needed to spend some time working out exactly what was happening and collecting some data. So we followed the children through the outpatient department. We collected the times when they arrived, when they were triaged, when they were assessed, and ultimately we tried to chase them to treatment um, to find out what time that happened. Uh, and we also shadowed the triage assessments of the nurses um, to see whether they were picking up the children. And as you can probably imagine, what we found was somewhat less than optimal. Uh, so. Of the 39 children that we saw over that week of observation who had emergency signs 
Um, so and for those of you um, for who did um, emergency triage and treatment training a while ago, I'll remind you these are definitely emergency signs, coma, convulsion, central cyanosis, signs of shock, obstructed airway. Of those 39 children, only 11 of them were recognized by the triage nurse. Of the 113 children that we saw who had priority signs, only 35 of them were picked up by the triage nurse. But things got worse as children moved through. Because of those children who had been recognized, so those 11 children who'd been recognized by the nurse to have emergency signs, the mean time to a medical assessment was 49 minutes, and the mean time to any treatment at all was 2 hours and 55 minutes. For the, ETAP, for the children with ETAP priority signs, those times were very similar because, of course, these children were undifferentiated. So everybody was moving through at their same pace. So this was, for us, I, I imagine for lots of you in the room, these are not shocking numbers. These are not, this is not a shocking picture. It's very similar to things that have been encountered in different places. Um, but we, we were struggling to work out what we were going to do in a place where we had uh, few medical resources, uh, very limited medical staffing, um, and a group who felt very, very demoralized. So a workforce who'd been used to um, large numbers of inexplicable child deaths every day, um, who'd been used to um, very little institutional support, um, and who didn't feel as if things could change for the better, who spent most of their time wrapping children for death. So we, we asked the nurses um, whether they would consider a different approach. Um, and we asked the nurses, who were mainly junior nurses, um, so known in Sierra Leone as state-enrolled community health nurses, um, a junior cadre who were traditionally not given enormous amounts of responsibility. We said, what if you took on some of this work? Um, what if you were in charge um, of supporting the children through triage assessment and also organizing appropriate treatment for them? Um, and whilst initially that was something that was slightly hard to take on, um, we persuaded them that at least we could try and give it a go. Harder was the conversation with hospital management. Uh, so when we proposed this idea, obviously people were a little bit resistant because we were proposing to take away something which was traditionally within the hospital structures and within the Ministry of Health Structures of Sierra Leone, the preserve of a medical doctor um, or at least uh, a community health officer, someone with extra training above the level of the nurse. And we were proposing at least as a temporary measure to give that to staff who were in a much more junior position. Um, but to give them enormous credit, the hospital administration listened to our proposal. They said they were willing to give it a try, and it took us a month to get started with piece of work. So what did we do? Well, we proposed um, to do three things at the same time, um, because there was a lot going on. To reorganize the processes um, within the triage department, uh, so I'm not going to talk through this um, lovely diagram which was created by our colleague Veronica, um, but to change the system so that pa medical patients could flow freely through the department straight to where they needed to be seen. They'd be triaged straight away and then taken to medical assessment if they were sick. To change the space and to create a resus area um, where children could receive immediate treatment if they needed it. But most importantly, to start a process of teaching, training, mentoring, supervising the nurses to learn the skills that they needed um, to be able to assess and treat children effectively. So, late in December of that year, we opened our New Look Outpatient Department, uh, staffed, managed, delivered by junior nurses. And obviously, we got their agreement initially. Everybody was on the same page. We were still quite trepidatious. We, we weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, and it was really, it was, it was a wonderfully fulfilling experience to watch them take to their task with gusto, to, um, to see them looking at a patient, trying hard to work out what sign is this, how do I interpret this, what's happened next, asking for help when they weren't sure, and prescribing the right treatments a lot of the time, um, and with increasing accuracy um, and increasing efficacy, um, and moving children through very quickly to good treatment. So we came back and we reassessed what happened um, in March of this year and also in June. Um, and the results are, I hope you'll agree, um, quite impressive. Uh, our colleagues, I think, have really done a wonderful job. 
Um, so from that initial depressing position in December where they weren't really able to identify emergency signs, by March it was 15 out of the 18 children who had emergency signs that were uh, accurately recognised. And in June, all 30 of the emergency sign children um, were picked up straight away by the triage nurse. But I think this is my favourite graph, and I'd like to stay here for a minute or two, um, because this is what happened to the times to assess, the times to treatment um, for the children with emergency signs. So that core group, um, where if you're in a, uh, a reference hospital where people are sending you sick children from the outlying peripheral health units, um, this is where you want to be able to make a difference. You want to see a sick child and give them the right treatment straight away. So clearly, there is a big jump from December. Um, to march um, across the different modalities of treatment. So time to oxygen, uh, time to assessment, time to oxygen, and time to IV treatment um, all come down very sharply. And a lot of that will be to do with uh, the fact that we changed the processes, we provided a treatment area, there were medicines available. But there's still um, a further decrease between March and June. We hadn't changed anything since the beginning of January. So all of that increase in improvement in time uh, that ability to recognize the child early, to get them onto the bed, uh, to get the diagnostic process moving, um, and to get an IV line in to get antimalarials is because the team was functioning better. And this is, this is where I think um, there are, for me, um, really interesting and important things to draw out. Why were the nurses so enthusiastic about this process? Um, why had things moved so well? Well, obviously, it's easier to run a big department and to see a lot of children um, if you have more people available. So the six house officers were continually stretched. Um, but still, we were asking these nurses to take on a much bigger task. We were loading them with extra responsibility. We were loading them with extra work. Um, there was always the danger that the doctors would come back to them and say, well, you're doing this job as a nurse, and actually, we don't think you're doing it very well, um, and we need to take it away from you. But in some ways, the nurses are much closer to the patients than the doctors. So if the doctor's children are unwell, they will go up to the private hospital in the old colonial part of Freetown. If I became unwell, I'd be airlifted out of the country. The nurses' children, if they became unwell, they came to the children's hospital. And as they started to deliver very efficient and effective treatment, people will come up to them in the market or in the street, give them presents, thank them, call them by name. And a virtuous circle was born. The nurses saw the impact of their work, not only every day on the unit, but also in their social community, around their hospital. Um, and they realized, they recognized, um, that this was an initiative um, that had value not only for them, but for everybody. So as it became clear that this new way of doing things was reducing the number of children who died, the nurses were equally clear that we weren't going to go back and change it to, to the old way. So I, th I think I'm, I can't see the clock from here, but I suspect I'm drawing near to the end of my time. So I'd like to close with a short anecdote from Christmas Day 2015. Uh, Mamasu was a two-year-old girl who was brought into the triage area and was recognized straight away as being very unwell by the triage nurses, who rushed her through into the recess area, pale, comatose. Um, and within 17 minutes, she'd had her HB checked and her glucose. Her HB was uh, two grams per deciliter. Her glucose, her blood sugar level was uh, 1.1 millimoles per liter. Uh, she had had her IV line inserted. Her oxygen had been started. She'd had a bolus of 10% dextrose. Her antibiotics and antimalarials had been administered. And her blood transfusion had already started, and she was on her way to the inpatient ward. So stories like that and others like them from triage and recess at Ola during. Uh, that I think demonstrates some of the power of giving the responsibility and the knowledge to the people within a healthcare system who need it. And that sometimes the inadequacy um, and the, the, the difficulty of old and traditional hierarchies. Uh, so from our experience and from this small project, nurse-led care for acutely unwell children in Sierra Leone works and can be implemented effectively. Uh, and I think there are potentially lessons that we can draw more widely for other pieces of work elsewhere. Thanks very much.
Thank you. Again, Thanks. very inspiring. Uh, another inspiring pediatrician, just like the first PED talk that we had today. Uh, Dr. Nadia Lafferty, would you also please come, from, come forward and collect your presents? <laughs> um, uh, so, um, does anyone have a short question for uh, Dr. Christopher Hans? Thank you very much. Yes, Louise. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I'm very impressed. Um, my, my question is basically if the training has been as well organized for the um, uh, IPD, for the inpatients. I mean, uh, recognized science is not only a question of triage, but as well a sudden uh, deterioration of the child uh, status inside. Uh, and if there is as well some of uh, training and reaction for recognize uh, sudden deterioration in the IPD for the nurses. So. If, uh, sorry, if, what's uh, the, if the child time? is hospitalized and yes. suddenly uh, show some, uh, well, actions to be taken and uh, definition in the middle of the night, if it's, uh, this training has been down as well for recognized early signs in the IPD. Yeah, yeah thanks very much. So uh, we, we initially rolled out the, uh, what should have been a refresher of ETAT training for the uh, staff in triage and recess. Um, we had, by the time we left, we'll be back in Sierra Leone in, in two weeks, but by the time we left in July, we'd rolled out that training for the, the um, nurses working in the two acute wards of the hospital where the children were sickest um, to try and help them to recognize those deteriorations. Um, and we have passed on the training package and coached um, a, a small group of nurses within the hospital who are the, the training faculty supervised by the nurse training office um, within the hospital. So our hope is um, that uh, with relatively minimal input from, from physicians or outsiders that actually that, that initiative will be self-sustaining.